we do expect some more people to dribble in, but I believe they would be prompt. I'm Margo Landman, Senior Director for Education Programs at the National Committee. It is a great pleasure to welcome Ian Johnson here in from Beijing at Yale's BS. We should give them credit, but we were able to get him on his way back. He has just published this, and I'm not being paid to say it. It is really a fantastic book, and it's big. It looks daunting. It's hard to put it down. And I didn't tell him this when we were speaking earlier, but it's not often that I read a book that's not related to war or something horrendous like that, and I find myself in tears. But there are sections of this book that are so moving that it's really extraordinary. So with that, I will turn it over to you, and I think we're in for a real treat. Well, thanks. <coughs> Just be sure to send me your Swiss bank account. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I was uh, participated in the, uh, in the Susan Rice Town Hall meeting when I was up at Yale, and, uh, and that was really interesting. And I was thinking how many facets there are to understanding China, because she was going through these big issues like counterterrorism, South China Sea, and, and, and those kind of things. Um, and one doesn't always think of religion as being something important uh, when thinking of China, except maybe in the sense of religious freedom or the, the State Department's annual report, uh, the that executive committee on, uh, on religious freedom that, that got set up and reports that it issues. Um, but overall, religion, except for maybe the persecution story, we don't really think of it in terms of related to China too much. Um, and I think that's um, a pity because China is going through what I, I would posit, uh, and I think we could prove is one of the great, a, a huge religious revival. Um, a, a growth of religion and spirituality that it has great implications for China um, in the long term and for how we, how we think about China and how we interact with China in the long term. So this is, this is, in other words, this talk today or this topic, it's not one of those uh, issues that will have an immediate impact on things, but it's one of those deeper structure issues that affect things in the long run. Uh, when I got interested in this topic, it seemed to be completely irrelevant. Uh, I got interested when I first went to China um, in 1984. Uh, I went there as a, as a student, and I was interested in religious issues and questions. I remember uh, looking for temples in China. It was almost like a game where you used, uh, you know, many of you can remember Nagel's Encyclopedia, this big sort of fat pink book that you can still buy on Amazon, actually. Uh, and it was made by French diplomats and scholars <coughs> in the 1960s. They, they traveled around Beijing and put it together. And that was one of the few guidebooks that we had. There, I don't think there was even, there wasn't a Lonely Planet, there might have been a Fodor's guidebook, but we would look for the temples in the Nagel's encyclopedia, uh, and we couldn't find it, except for uh, one Buddhist temple, one Taoist temple, one mosque, you know, on Ox Street, on Miojie, one Protestant church, and one Catholic church. And this was in a city of, at the time, what, roughly six or eight million people. So it seemed that religious life was really dead, and that these places of worship were just the kind of things you typically saw in a communist country that were almost like a museum to some sociological phenomenon that had died out. Um, and a few years before that, when I was doing research, I found this quote by a prominent political scientist in the 1970s who wrote, of the astounding fact of our time, a nation state with one fourth of the Earth's population with hardly a trace of religion as man has known it. <laughs> so that was uh, strange. Oh, I want to start this uh, slideshow. This might not be. These are pictures that are not directly related to every word I'm saying now, but are just to give you 
an idea of the religious <clears throat> life, they, they rotate through every few minutes. But these kind of scenes, this is from the Lama Temple in Beijing. All the photos were taken by a friend of mine, a photographer, professional photographer, hence they look really great. Uh, and like most journalist photos, anyway, this uh, shows, uh, shows some, some people worshiping. And she has, was that a coach bag or a Gucci bag? Right? So that's one of these difficult things. But um, these kind of scenes were unimaginable in China in the 1980s. They were not very. Uh, I don't think they existed. <coughs> now, this was understandable that people had this idea that religion was dead or, or, un, or, or barely existent because China at that point had been going through what, in hindsight, and with a bit, a bit of historical perspective, we can see was one of the great anti-religious campaigns in, I don't want to say in history, but certainly in a long time. This goes back to the 19th century. Didn't, we often think it just had to do with the Cultural Revolution or maybe just had to do with communism because communists are atheists so they must hate religion and they destroyed all religious life. And certainly that plays a role. But the attacks on religion go back to the 19th century to the crisis of confidence that China went through in the wake of the Opium Wars. And this feeling that traditional Chinese ideas, values, uh, culture and including religion were backward and were holding the country back from from progress and from competing with the West. The, these, you have to think of the profound uh, worry and fear that Chinese people had as they saw Western countries carving up the world. India was a British colony. Africa was carved up. China was being eaten away at it. There was this feeling, you know, we'll try to be next. So people looked for more and more radical ideas. And at first, there were these ideas of the self-strengthening movement, which might be something one recalls from, uh, from history books. But there, there began to be, as the defeats piled up upon the defeats, this idea that there was something inherently wrong with Chinese tradition and culture, and including religion. Religion, it's important to think of religion um, as being at the center of this. Because nowadays, we think of religion as something separate from the rest of something as a, sort of as a separate pillar in society, something you might do independently on your own one day of the week at a certain place. But in traditional China, as in most traditional cultures, religion, politics, culture were all intertwined. <coughs> it's hard to separate the two. Uh, emperor was the son of heaven, <coughs> was legitimized through religious rituals that he carried out. Religion was part of the fabric of everyday life. Temples were in the phrase, the memorable phrase, that was memorable for me, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, historian Prasenja Duara, temples were the nexus of power in traditional China. It was like a cathedral and a city hall in a European city put together. This is where the elites were often the ones who ran the temples, uh, and these were the same elites who might uh, organize irrigation or the militia against bandits and so on and so forth. The people who ran the temples were the people, the, the literati, the gentry who ran local society. So religion, if you are a reformer and you think there's something wrong with Chinese society, it's hard to attack that, to overthrow that, without overthrowing the religious political order, religion being part of the political order. And this is, uh, you think back to 1898, the 100 days of reform, ill-fated but still telling, Kang Youwei promoted the idea, this is one of the great reformers in the Qing dynasty in the early Republican era, of converting temples to schools. So, miao uh, gai xiao. So you want to be, we, couldn't, we have too many temples, we have too much of this stuff, we need schools, we need science, we need progress. Um, Sun Yat-sen, as a young revolutionary before setting out in Guangdong, in his home village, went to the local temple to Janu, a, a Taoist deity, with a stick and smashed the statues. This was his act of liberation. I'm getting rid of all of this old dross that's holding us back. And this crystallizes in the May 4th movement, 
1919, science and democracy are what's needed. So when the KMT asserts control over China in the 1920s, and of course it only ran China effectively for a decade, but even in that short period, one of its uh, one of the laws that it's passed was a law to determine which temples should be preserved and which temples should be destroyed. Uh, there was the, the New Life Movement under Chiang Kai-shek to cure China of social ills like gambling, prostitution, opium smoking, foot binding, and traditional religion. So you had young people went out from places like Nanjing and uh, surveyed temples and sometimes even destroyed temples. Uh, a very mild but it's telling precursor of Red Guards, say about four decades later. So this is why, uh, then when the communists take over, of course they're the most radical of the groups that want to reform China, they carry this through to its logical conclusion. In the 1950s, out of the wreckage of this old system, they allow five religious groups to organize, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Protestantism, and Catholicism, so those are the five religions, although Christianity is sort of divided into two religions in China, and many Chinese people today, especially Protestants and, and Catholics, think they are separate religions, and maybe people in the West think that also, but anyway, um, uh, these five groups are still the only five groups that are allowed to exist in China today. Hence, when anything rises up, um, it is de facto illegal. Uh, that system of five religions only lasted for a few years. By the end of the 1950s, Mao has China following increasingly radical uh, path, uh, the Great Leap Forward. There were attacks on religious, religion then. Um, the four cleanups in the early 1960s, which is aimed primarily at, at village life in China, it doesn't get as much attention, but was probably, for most Chinese people, as, um, as it had as much effect as the Cultural Revolution. And then the Cultural Revolution in 1966 <coughs> to 1976, um, basically you can say that all religious life was, all public religious life was closed. All temples, mosques, churches were closed and religious life was pushed underground. So when I was there, religion was actually coming back but it wasn't that apparent for a callow youth like myself <laughs> in the 1980s. But, in 1982, the government had actually issued a famous important document, Document 19, which allowed for temples, churches, mosques to reopen, seminaries to reopen. But this was seen as a sop to society, something that just to help out the old people who had suffered so much that to let Granny Wong go to the temple and light incense for Buddha, and she'll die off anyways. And as we progress to socialism and communism, all of this stuff will disappear. Of course, it doesn't disappear, it just grows. And even a journalist like myself couldn't miss that when I came back in the 1990s. 1994, uh, I returned to the Baltimore Sun and then later worked for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I encountered an eccentric businessman from Shanghai, an American, Brock Silvers, uh, who uh, is an old friend of mine, and he started a US registered charity to rebuild Taoist temples. And he said, I'm sitting in Shanghai doing business. You're a reporter traveling China. You can be the eyes and ears of our, of our charity and see what's going on with Taoism. So that got me traveling around, God oh, traveled around China. I didn't tell the Wall Street Journal this all the time, but I'd often build an extra <laughs> day in. So if I had to do something on Monday and Tuesday, I'd arrive on Saturday. Not a bad idea anyways, just to have a little bit of, of uh, idling time in China so you're not always focused on the next meeting. And, 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 and looked around and I realized that religion was, uh, was taking off and that the few tens of thousands of dollars that Brock and his friends could raise were nothing because Chinese people were pouring tons of money into temples especially. That's what I was looking at. And you can see this if you go to Chinese temples nowadays, or any anytime you can see these um, <clears throat> steelies that list the donors. And it used to be to get on a steely, it was enough if you donated 10 kwai or 50 <laughs> kwai. Now you have to donate at least 100 or 1,000, and you have many steelies to families that have donated tens of thousands of yuan. Um, and many of these temples that 
even then were being rebuilt were costing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some of it paid for by tourism, but a lot of it paid for by pious people who wanted to share their newfound wealth. Um, why? I think the reason is that, this is, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying a bit, people, there are many, many reasons why people uh, turn to religion and faith and spirituality, but I think there was a, a feeling that the old system was destroyed, the old traditional system in China was destroyed, communism was discredited, there was nothing, there was no social contract in China except go ahead and make money and just don't get involved in politics, especially after 89. That became an especially crass. So some people, of course, we all know, went down to Shenzhen and got rich, made a lot of money. But other people began to feel that there was something wrong with society. That there was a lack of moral values. And this is reflected in the rise of Qigong, the Qigong uh, fever that hit in the 80s and especially the 90s. And just as a refresher, nowadays when you say Qigong in China, a lot of people smirk or laugh or go, oh, you know, that was something from back then. But it, Qigong is a, it's a, a, a created word, a neologism from the 1950s that puts together a lot of physical cultivation and practice, meditation, some things like Tai Chi that you can think of as somewhat analogous to yoga in the Indian um, religious tradition. This was um, allowed as a healing practice. It was used as a healing practice in hospitals in China in the 50s and 60s, along with acupuncture and herbal medicine and cupping and burning moxa and things like that. It was banned in the Cultural Revolution. And then after the Cultural Revolution, it jumped into the public sphere. And it became very prevalent in parks around China. So if you went to parks in the 80s and 90s, you'd see people um, sitting, <coughs> meditating, or maybe making some slow move slow motion sort of movements, hugging trees, uh, burping really loudly, uh, doing all kinds of things to get the chi flowing, to get mo moving. Um, and for most people, it, initially at first, it was some kind of a, uh, just a physical cultivation. The anthropologist Nancy Chun has a really nice, interesting book that she published in the late 90s or early 2000s called Breathing Spaces. And she quotes a Qigong master or a Qigong practitioner who says, it releases the soul of China after the trauma of the Cultural Revolution. So it's almost a way, a cathartic experience for people to in public um, let it all sort of out in these somewhat eccentric practices. But what really became noticeable as the 90s progressed was that these Qigong teachers, these masters, these grand masters, these Da Shi, that they were writing tracts, moral guidebooks that were often very simple pamphlets and booklets, but became increasingly sophisticated. The best organized of them, of course, was Falun Gong, and then it uh, made a, a fatal uh, tactical error in trying to challenge the government by doing a sit-down strike in front of Zhongnanhai, something that <laughs> I would not advise <laughs> if somebody to ask me. But, uh, but they wanted to be recognized as a religion. They wanted to be, or at least recognized. They were, like other Qigong groups, groups they, were, they were registered as a martial arts group. So they were registered under the Martial Arts Association of China. And they wanted some sort of recognition. It wasn't forthcoming. They protested. Crackdown came. But um, these things didn't go away. And into the new century, uh, there was more and more religious activity. And I, I, I can't prove this with a document, but it's certainly sequentially correct. And a lot of Chinese think it's true, a lot of scholars in Beijing I've talked to, that the government probably realized that there was this growing desire for spirituality, that the five official religions were limited in what they could do. They couldn't proselytize. You still can't proselytize in China. But if you were a Qigong group, you could go to a park and you could hand out pamphlets and propaganda material and recruit new members <clears throat> and it was kind of no problem. So I think in the in the new century they said okay we can't allow Falun Gong and these groups to exist but we're going to not exactly unshackle but free up a little bit some of the acceptable religious groups especially Taoism and Buddhism. And the government also um, just in, in the Hu Jintao era 
but especially, and I'll get to it in a second, especially the Xi Jinping era, they began to look at practices that had been classified as superstitious. And they reclassified a lot of this as traditional culture. So uh, in the 90s, I remember outside the Lama Temple, the temple I showed here at the, the very first slide, that they, the government would regularly round up people who were telling fortunes. And they often were sitting on the side of the street and they had some kind of a you know, piece of paper out and they tell your fortune. So the government always rounded these people up and tossed them out, out of Beijing or sent them back to Shanxi or wherever they came from and said, this is feudal superstition, you know, feng jian mixing. You never, you almost never hear that nowadays unless it's some official being charged with corruption and they need to add to his rap sheet. So then they sort of add that he's engaged in superstitious activities. But by and large, a lot of this stuff became acceptable. The government, now if you go to the Lama Temple, for example, the alleys all around it are filled with stores that do nothing but tell fortunes, give you a new name if you want to get a new name, Ximing and stuff like that. Uh, things that were not allowed in the past. Uh, the government did this by, so there was a lot of, a lot of feeling that, in, in, and a big discussion throughout the 2000s that a lot of Chinese religious life didn't fit neatly into these five categories, especially not the traditional practice. That you had Buddhism, you had Taoism, but you had a lot of stuff that didn't fit neatly into that. The worship of holy mountains, or of things like Mazu, the, the goddess on, in the coastal areas of China, or the earth god, um, or the hearth god, the, the, the kitchen god. Where did that fit in? Those weren't officially part of uh, Taoism. They, they were actually, many of them were Taoism, but they weren't part of the Taoist structure that had been set up. So what to do with that? And some people thought they would create a new category called folk religion or popular religion. I think the government thought that was too complicated. If you go from five to six religions, then what about other religions? What about Hinduism? What about Judaism? There were many people in China who wanted to, um, say, practice uh, openly Jewish faith and uh, even asked for the old synagogue in Shanghai to be uh, open for worship, and that was not allowed. So instead, the government redefined a lot of these traditional practices as culture. And they used a term from UNESCO, from the United Nations Education Science Cultural Organization, called intangible cultural heritage, uh, or in Chinese, fei. And fei can be anything, it can be, it can be many things that are, have absolutely no spiritual, say, or at least no obvious spiritual practice, um, like, say, cuisine, uh, or some kind of dance, or drama. But because so many things in traditional China had a religious component, uh, music, for example, uh, you can say, okay, we're just defining this as a traditional musical practice. But when you look at it, a lot of the music had a spiritual practice as well. It would be like, in a way, it's like we might say Bach, if we said Bach had nothing to do with religion, Bach is only something for the concert hall. And some people might say, but wait, Bach was actually writing a lot of this, most of this, for a church. So what's happened in China, they've said, this music is intangible cultural heritage. It's now OK to do that. You got approval. You got national and or local recognition to do that. You might even get some subsidies to do that. And we'll just turn a blind eye to the fact that 99% of what you're doing is actually in a temple or at a funeral or something like that. So you see this with Mazu, the, the, uh, the, the goddess um, for uh, ship fairs and, and, and fisher folk on the coast from Tianjin all the way down the coast. She's an extremely popular deity. This is now considered intangible cultural heritage. But people go into the temples, they light incense, they bow, they worship, etc. But the government just says, no, this is intangible cultural heritage. So I think in that way, it's quite, it's quite, it's, it's an ingenious, a uh, very pragmatic move to allow a lot of this stuff to come back. Um, this became more and more of a national issue and less, uh, and less of a sort of <clears throat> esoteric or sideline issue, I think, throughout the 2000s, as China went through what I think a lot of people feel is a, uh, a spiritual void or a spiritual vacuum. 
you hear this constantly when you talk to people in China, the idea that there are no minimum moral values. I, I mentioned in the 1990s that this was an issue, but I think it's really ramped up, maybe because of social media or maybe because more and more people feel that their material needs are slaked and they are worried about society as a whole. What kind of a society do they, do they live in? What kind of society are their children uh, growing up in? Uh, a society that where corruption is, is for many people is rampant, where they feel they can't trust the, the food that's, that they eat, that, that is tainted, that's poisoned in some way. Of course, air pollution. Uh, and, and, and for many people, the solution may be reform, maybe political reform. If you're a dissident, you may say China needs political reform. If you're inside the system, you may say, no, China needs uh, better forms of governance. We can uh, react better to social needs. We can, uh, we can have better food inspections so that there isn't tainted food, etc. We can clean up the air. But for many Chinese people, I'd say the most, most people probably feel that there's a spiritual or values component, that society lacks values and that there is a need for some kind of value. And this is something um, that I think really has come to the national fore under Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has made the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation his signature campaign. Uh, we see this, I think what probably gets the most attention is the campaign against corruption. And that's, but that's more of the stick approach to it. The carrot approach to it is trying to more positively create values that people can credibly believe in. And I think she's done that a little bit by turning toward religious things. And I want to just switch um, away from this for a second. I can probably do this. Unless there's somebody who uh, knows how to. I want to open the other PowerPoint. Maybe I don't have some count, but I have another PowerPoint with some pictures. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll obviously have enough. I'll just leave that up for now. Um, but when he took office, oh yeah, he spoke about the need for rejuvenation. Many people thought this in uh, nationalistic terms uh, or that it only in, say, political terms. I think a lot of people have, in China, have taken this to mean in a moral term. And it's striking, I think, his attitude toward religions and toward other broader things that might be thought of as faith or, or spiritualism. And um, Well, we don't have to look at the pictures, but I, I wanted to uh, show a picture uh, of, of the various meetings he had. If you remember, he took, he took office in 2012, exactly five years ago, uh, after the 18th Party Congress, went to the National Museum on Tiananmen Square, um, announced the China Dream, the, the slogan or the, the campaign for the China Dream, that this would be a campaign of national rejuvenation. And over the next couple of years made, a, I think, a a few striking visits with people in the religious sphere. He went to Chufu, uh, to Confucius's hometown, praised Confucius and the Analects. Um, he, in 2013, he also went to UNESCO and praised Buddhism as having made huge contributions to Chinese civilization. Uh, he has met regularly with Chinese leaders uh, and not just the heads of the patriotic associations that nominally run religion in China, but people like the Taiwanese uh, Buddhist leader Xing Yun, who runs a missionary uh, society in, in, uh, in, in Taiwan, a Buddhist missionary society, and he's had gotten permission to build a, a big library and various cultural centers around China to promote Buddhism, and an enormous temple um, outside of Yixing in, uh, in, in central China, in the Yangtze ri River uh, Valley. Um, and she has pushed these ideas, I think, and, and used a lot of traditional religious or cultural imager imagery, which I think is quite unusual. He um, has adopted 
uh, pictures that come from, and this is where I'm going to show some pictures, but it's not entirely necessary to see them, um, for his China Dream campaign that are very different from how other propaganda campaigns looked in the past. You know, most propaganda campaigns in the past, sort of a red banner with uh, black or white or gold characters on it, it's pretty dull and it sort of faded into the background. Um, a lot of them, even up until recently, still focused on Lei Feng, who's the communist model hero. Um, and, you know, we also laugh at Lei Feng. The funny thing is a lot of Chinese people laugh at Lei Feng too. And especially people who think about these things a little bit. And I have in my book a, a Chinese thinker named Ran Yunfei who said, if you think about Lei Feng for 30 seconds, you realize it's, it's sort of, the whole thing's a fraud, right? There was always this photographer nearby taking amazing photos of this guy, and uh, that he apparently had almost no education, but he wrote his diary, was in perfect, eloquent Chinese. How could this possibly be? And if you think about it, it's, it's sort of BS. Uh, but this is the best the Communist Party has. So this is why, uh, I think she and the other propagandists around him, and in my book I recount the story of one propagandist in, in particular who worked on the China Dream campaign, who uh, began to come up with other ideas that people, that they, that the party could use. Um, and to try to use slogans and, I, and, and uh, concepts like filial piety from traditional China. So this is, I think, a, a, a huge shift in the government's side. This doesn't mean that the government is now embracing religion <clears throat> or that the government is uh, allowing a new era of religious freedom and tolerance or anything like that. But I think toward certain religions, and here I would specifically say Buddhism, Taoism, and folk religion, by and large, the government has uh, quite a, a tolerant policy. Uh, I would exclude in Buddhism, I would exclude Tibetan Buddhism. There, that's uh, something quite different and, and the government is much more uh, skeptical <clears throat> or, or, or wary of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and Christianity and Islam also are problematic in the government's view. In general, the government's view toward religions is similar to, uh, to its view toward uh, NGOs in that uh, it doesn't want any foreign ties. So if there are foreign ties, it's a problem. If there are uh, no or limited foreign ties, it's acceptable. So, oh, okay. I can show you some of these. Just skip through some of this stuff. No, construction. Yeah, talked about that already. <laughs> this is the thing that really ticks me off the most. This is the thing also I think that ticks off a lot of Chinese people. When you're driving around, if you if you're not in the, what people always call the middle class, but I think they really mean the upper middle class or upper class in China. Um, you always get, you're always being pushed aside and being reminded constantly of the law of the jungle, essentially. That if you're, um, if you're a, 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 a bicyclist, you're being driven off the, the bicycle paths by the electric bicycles. If you're an electric bicyclist, you're getting pushed off by the cars. If you're a pedestrian, you're getting pushed off by the bicycle and electric bicycles. Um, sidewalks in Beijing are almost unwalkable in some parts of the city because not only of these uh, rental bicycles that are all over the place, but because people ride the motor their motorized bicycles down the street. And I always thought, could an authoritarian government do a better job in enforcing at least the traffic rules? But maybe that goes to show that all governments have limited political capital, and if you spend a lot of your time on existential threats like uh, you know, whatever, then you don't have time for a bicycle. But yeah, I think that really ticks off people and these other scandals that come up over and over. This was uh, the little girl that got run over and nobody helped her. Uh, some of these resonate in, in this country as well. I think we also feel a huge gap between rich and poor, that there are a lack of social values. And it's part of the reason for the rise of populist parties in the West, the populist movements. Um, and so I think this is something the Chinese feel as well. So this is she, uh, his response at the um, at the museum. And here's Lei Feng, our old friend Lei Feng. Spontaneously, there's a Xinhua photographer taking a picture of him. He's, he's polishing his uh, liberation truck. I guess that's what it probably is. Uh, yeah, um, 
and you still see Lefon around on these little bulletin boards, but he's basically faded from view. You don't see him too much. You can see him here. His, you know, his he hat. was all over Quinlan this summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think they're... He's everywhere. Yeah, they haven't given up on Lefon. But um, I think he's been pushed, overall he's been pushed to the background. Uh, here's Xi and Chu Fu. There he is meeting Xing Yun. He's met Xing Yun, this Buddhist missionary leader, uh, four times. Uh, he would have, so the first four years that she was in power, he met him. Last year he didn't meet him because Xing Yun had a, a mild stroke and wasn't able to meet him. He's met him every time and praised his works and his work in spreading traditional Chinese culture, not religion, even though there are temples and people light incense and stuff like that. Uh, I've met Xing Yun himself. He's um, actually, despite the stroke, he's in fairly good health. And uh, this is the propagandist that I write about in my book. These are the people who came up with the China Dream campaign, realizing that the traditional imagery wouldn't, wouldn't work. Uh, this guy has, uh, is a, <coughs> say, a dyed in the wool Maoist. He's from Hunan. Uh, in, he got into college in 19, when was it Gaokao? It was in 77. 77. I think he took the test in 78. And he wrote a pan to Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong, the greatest guy, since blah, 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 since Baozi were invented. Fantastic, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. They thought he was being sarcastic and failed him. And then he said, my essay, you know, I wrote a blah, and he got some teacher of his, and they reevaluated it. And said, oh, hey, he's serious, because this is 78, right? The Cultural Revolution just ended two years earlier. So he got into uh, university, and uh, then later worked in Hunan propaganda, uh, various propaganda uh, <coughs> offices, wrote an opera to Mao, and starting around 2011, so just before Xi took power, he began to have a sort of uh, change of heart. I think as the party began to change, he began to go around advising governments, um, especially in Guizhou, which is an interesting place. There's a lot of traditional culture promoted in Guizhou over the past decade or so, for various reasons. It's probably too speculative, too complicated to get into. but he. He said, what you really need to do, and this is actually his conversations with the local propaganda office are on Yoku, on the sort of Chinese version of YouTube. So what you really need to do is promote Confucian values. If you want to have credible uh, heroes, uh, find somebody that people can relate to. So they found a, a, a guy who was a small business person, a small private entrepreneur who was very loyal to his parents, and his old parents didn't have a place to live, so he built them a new place, and blah, 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 blah. And they actually made him the centerpiece of a small, localized propaganda campaign. Um, so he's starting to advise people on that. Um, I follow him on, on WeChat, and we're buddies, and you see all kinds of great stuff. He tells you all the classics that he's reading, the works he's on. I met him several times. It looks like a meeting of the Cosa Nostra or something like that. Um, so in late 2012, uh, it looks like we're, anyways, uh, I don't know how happy it's seen. So in late 2012, um, they decide they need something more effective and they need something that's not going to be lay fun. And they try to think, what is the kitschiest, most traditional, old fashioned thing? They hit upon these clay figurines uh, that are kind of like Norman Rockwell paintings. They hearken back to this uh, period of, of you know, feel-good traditional values. And they, he and this other guy go to uh, Tianjin, where the studio is located. It was nationalized. And they look around, and they see this girl, the chubby girl. And it's in, the, in the, uh, a cabinet behind the craftsman, the artisan, who uh, made it, and they ask him, what is that? And they say, he said, it's called longing. It's about a little kid just wistfully daydreaming, thinking of things, and then in their telling of the story, I don't know how it's apocryphal, if it's real or not, they said, no, 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 we're going to call it China Dream, My Dream. So it sounds too good to be true, right? But anyways, they did come up with that slogan, and there she is, um, and then they have their madman type uh, <laughs> brainstorming session. This is the official, the original, this is a later brainstorming session that he put on a way. That's his name, Yi Ching. This place is this thing. Um, and they create these posters, which 
blanketed China, uh, are still, you can still see them in, in China, see China Dream, My Dream. And there were all these poems that he wrote, that each Chen wrote, he dashed off uh, to go with the, with the little girl, and they went back to the well many times, went back to the studio and got other clay figurines, um, like these people, and then put them there, and then these people, and put them there. And many of these, uh, here are at the Workers' Gymnasium in Beijing, and he told me, we're gonna have a 60,000 kilometer campaign. I said, what does that mean? He said, 60, 000, there are 60,000 kilometers of highway. I don't know if that's true. Huh? And he said that we're going to blanket every square foot of every, and it, for a while it did seem like that. Everywhere you went, there were these posters. And subsequently, uh, <coughs> well, this is uh, a short, bizarre, humorous aside, the campaign was so successful that this propagandist won, won a public service campaign, a campaign award. Which I thought it was a strange thing. I thought, you know, public service advertising campaigns are like Ogilvy and Mather donate time to develop something, you know, a campaign against cancer. It's not the Communist Party hires a propagandist to make a campaign <laughs> to push Xi Jinping by, and for that you get an award. Anyways, he got this big award, and the, the girl went viral. In fact, she's still, she's now become a Gumby like figure if on Hainan Air uh, safety, you know, the screen in front of you before the safety announcement, you have to. She's moving around and <laughs> telling you about the China dream and something like, you know, Jingye, like whatever, a thrift and being hardworking and xiao and filial piety. Anyway, they then said, let's find a girl, a real girl who looks like the clay girl. So they found this woman on the left um, who is not a girl. She's a 30-year-old who is dressed to look like she's four years old. And then they said, well, that's so great. Let's do a painting of the woman. So they did a painting of the... And then, this has absolutely nothing to do with my theme, but I couldn't resist it. They decided to put her on mushroom sauce canisters to sell mushrooms, a certain brand of mushroom sauce. Anyways, I don't know what that exactly tells us, except our propaganda isn't dead. Um, now, the campaigns are, um, you don't always see the girl or the clay figurines, but <clears throat> they are using these traditional images and traditional ideas. Um, I think not to replace the communist ideology. This, isn't, this is not Vladimir Putin's Russia, where Putin uh, becomes a defender of the Orthodox Church. You know, ex-KGB man apparently had an accident in the 1990s, and then all of a sudden he realizes, oh my God, I'm religious after all, and now he, he carries the cloak of, of, of the super defender of the faith. Um, Xi Jinping is not in such a weak position. So they still, as you said, they still have Lei Feng, they still have their core socialist values, but this is a buttress. I think it's something that party thinks it can Used. And I, I guess I focused a lot on the politics because the, the party congress just ended. And I think that this is still part of Xi's idea that we have to create values. We need to create a new culture in China um, in the sense of a corporate culture. You know, just, just like you have the idea of corporate culture, the things that unify an organization or an institution, you need that for the country as well. Part of it, yes, patriotism, but part of it also, I think, traditional ideas and values. Um, again, not all religions, skepticism toward Islam and Christianity. Uh, so, yeah, these are more campaigns. This is in, this is like lazy man work. This is in Rutan Park near where I live, but this is promoting traditional family uh, rearing methods by, uh, there's a whole series of, of these um, bulletin boards uh, promoting, a, I think, a 16th century yeah, philosopher of ideas. And, um, anyways, listen, I think I'll stop there. Um, I'll find a nice slide to end it with. This <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, no, no. And uh, we can, you may have questions on, um, you may have questions on other things, other parts of religion. What about the cross removal campaign in China? What about Islam? I'm happy to answer those questions. But for now, I think I'll stop and open the floor for questions. Great. Thank you. That was wonderful. Questions? Okay, please identify yourself. Sure. I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about the Catholic Church in China. I mean, you said that they're not very hospitable to Christianity, but how is the the underground church doing? Is that still growing? And what about the officially? Right? That issue. I just did an article for America magazine on the church in China. Um, America is a, a Jesuit-run Catholic magazine. Uh, but I think overall, um, if I answer it more broadly, I think Christianity is viewed um, with skepticism by the government because of its foreign ties. And obviously, Catholicism uh, it has inherent ties with the Vatican. And this is a, a major problem for the government. Um, I th the Pope has been trying over the past year, or more than a year now, to reopen, or there has been reopened dialogue with Beijing, uh, speculation that there would be a deal, there'll be some sort of reestablished diplomatic ties. I, I've always wondered if that would work, and I, I think the fact that there hasn't been a deal and that the, this has slowed, it seems to me that it, the, the negotiations have slowed down. It's because primarily Beijing wants control over religious organizations and on some level, the church can't accept that. Uh, the primary issue for the church is the appointment of bishops. There, you would have to have a deal for who would appoint the bishops. I think if the Pope allowed Beijing to have the final word, many Catholics would feel that this is a sellout, especially many Catholics in China, people in the underground church who have been sort of carrying the torch for the past 70 years would feel that they've been betrayed. So that it would, will require a delicate balancing act by the Pope, and I think this is why it's a lot more complicated than people have imagined. Um, but you know, it's important also to think that, thinking about the foreign ties, all these religions do have a foreign component. Protestantism uh, in China especially has many ties to Chinese American, Chinese Canadian, Chinese Australian, uh, Christian communities. Islam, anyway, ties to the global Uma, the Hajj, uh, Buddhism, you, you have Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lama in exile, Taoism not so much, and I think maybe that's why Taoism and folk religion and these things are viewed plus skepticism, but this is something the government worries about, these foreign ties, so. Uh, yeah, Chris Merck. Um, <clears throat> with, I'm a, on the board for the United Board for Christian Higher Education in Asia, so we have an interest in this subject. And I'm wondering um, if you have tried to track the what happens to the uh, money or the funding for te major temples today, and if so, if you've had any success in figuring out who gets it and yes. where it goes. The money and where it goes. Yeah, not surprisingly, maybe religious organizations in China are, are not dissimilar from society as a whole, and, and, and often religious groups are run by uh, charismatic figures or authoritarian figures. There isn't always a lot of transparency in how money is spent. <laughs> um, this applies to churches as well. Um, and I think the issue of the temples is tricky because of the intermingling of commerce and faith in China, the fact that so many temples are run by a tourism authority, or the Cultural Affairs Bureau and the local government. This has had a, a bad effect, I think, on many of the temples. It's made them into primarily profit-generating um, centers for the local government. Uh, one of the, this book is structured around five different stories, five case studies, and one of them is a pilgrimage to Miaofengshan, which is a mountain about 40 miles outside of Beijing in the Western Mountains. A uh, big, big pilgrimage, a historic, important pilgrimage. Uh, the temple itself should be run by the Taoist Association of China. It has a Taoist deity, main deity. It's, it's been historically a Taoist temple, but it's run by the local district government in Beijing, uh, Mengtogo, at their tourism development uh, authority. And they actually run the temple and they collect the gate receipts. And in, and in a funny twist, this could only happen in the early 90s in China, that tourism development agency listed on the 
uh, Shenzhen stock market in 1991 <laughs> or 92. So I think it's a great investment opportunity <laughs> because stable and growing revenues, you know, future-oriented uh, line of business. But I don't think the government. I think the government doesn't like that, and the government has in Beijing. I think the central authorities don't like that. A lot of religious scholars in China who write for the State Administration of Religious Affairs they don't like this method, this model. But so much of this happened in the go-go '90s that it's hard to turn the clock back. Sarah. Yes, Sarah Miles Williams, Miles and Company. I have a question about these the house churches, which I guess were you know both Protestant and Catholic. Um, and I've been under the impression that there are millions of Christians in China who aren't necessarily going to official churches. Uh, what has happened under Xi Jinping? Because my sense is that there have been, over the years, crackdowns on some of these people. Um, I've known foreigners who were associated with these people <coughs> who were afraid to visit them for fear of exposing them, I mean, being associated with foreigners, this kind of thing. Under the Xi... Um, you know, she's obviously <clears throat> cracking down on a lot of, of dissidents. Are these house Christians included in that group, and what's what's happened? Uh, yeah, so there are there are all kinds of estimates about the number of Christians in China. I think Protestants and Catholics together, maybe I, I, I'm more conservative. I would say 50 to 60 million. Let's say 50 million Protestants and 10 uh, million Catholics. The upper end, I think, for Catholics is 12 million. There's a lot of good studies maybe showing 10.5 might be more accurate. Um, anyway, so let's is, just say... I'm six, sorry, is that an aggregate of house church? Yes, exactly. So my, 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 I would say about half of those are underground in each faith, okay. in each group, Protestant and Catholic. So about half are underground and half are legitimate. So it's, it's hard to tell. The government has not issued uh, a white paper on religion with statistics since the late 1990s, uh, but there are about uh, if you talked if you looked at the numbers from the three self patriotic movement for Protestants, there are about 25 million people active in the Protestant Church. Now that could be undercounting the number in the in, in the official Protestant Church, and then maybe another roughly another 25 million in the underground church. Um, I don't always use a, I personally I don't use the word underground because some of them are underground. Um, some of them are house churches meeting in a room like this in somebody's living room and they are uh, running from the law and you have to you know, knock three times or something like that before entering the, the house. And, but most of them are not. Uh, most of them, the g local government is fully aware that they exist. Public Security Bureau is not as incom that incompetent. And they, uh, many of these churches are quite big. The churches, the church that I write about here, my case study about a Protestant church is an unregistered church in Chengdu, and it has about 300 members. And you get many of these big urban churches that have um, that have been uh, that, that are growing in, in, in all the in all the big Chinese cities: Changsha, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, and other uh, down through the line. Um, I think this is that the government feels that if these churches are really just about, about about pious people meeting for a service, it's by and large okay, and they can keep tabs on it. But <laughs> if there is some anti-government activity, then of course they'll crack down on it. There have been a few churches uh, that have been closed down. In 2010, there was the Shou Wang Church in Beijing, a well-known church. That's kind of the exception. There are many other Shouwang churches in Beijing that are open and functioning. Uh, there was a church in Guiyang, uh, was it the Stone of Life Church? I can't remember exactly the name of it. It's been written up quite a bit if you go to China Aid, the uh, Christian advocacy NGO, they've written up that. Uh, but by and large, so I think the, the going forward, the problem for the government is are they going to be are they going to implement these religious regulations that they passed last year they passed new regulations last year are they going to implement them very um, very severely are they going to really enforce and really require all the churches to register with the government which is what the regulations call for now I think the government is probably too pragmatic for that I think they'll use this as a stick against certain 
churches, certain groups that seem to cross some kind of a line. If they were to go after all these tens of millions of underground Christians, I think it would be it would make it would be another Falun Gong. It would be in in, in the sense of having people hauled off to jail on a daily basis and thousands of people being sent to labor camps and so on. I can't imagine that they would do that. And I also think it would be really hard because they'd be alienating a lot of the people they really want and for the country's modernization, for the country's economic progress. It's striking to me when you go to these big churches in big Chinese cities, how many of them are white collar professionals, uh, how many of them are working for even foreign companies. Um, these are the people you want for China's future pro economic development. And you can't alienate all these people. So I, I don't think they'll implement it across the board, but I think it could be that there's a test of wills over the next couple of years. John? John Lowett from the committee. I'm curious about uh, religious education and whether this is really an adult pursuit or whether there are, uh, and I'm not referring to monks uh, that end, but for the, the average practitioner, whether they be Catholic or Protestant or Muslim or how are they, you know, what, how do they get educated? What is the connection? Where does government fit in? Does this fall exclusively under Ministry of right. Culture, Education, so forth? Well, the government has a monopoly on education from uh, one through nine. Um, and many parents, though, send their kids to religious schools even starting in preschool, kindergarten, uh, on the weekends. Uh, and some churches, such as the church I write about in Chengdu, has its own elementary school. Um, it was just starting when I was writing about it. It's, now there are about, it's K to three. So it's not a huge number, and I think the government hasn't closed down, perhaps because there's only about 15 or 20 kids in the school, so they probably feel it's not such a threat. Um, and, and there are some other examples of, 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 of churches, but also this sort of na this guoshue, this National Society for Confucian Studies. This is really where the vast numbers of people are involved. Those are very popular among parents who want to instill traditional values, traditional ideas in their children. So they'll go to these schools on the weekend or preschool and memorize things like the Sanzi Jing, the three character classic, uh, learn calligraphy, copy things out. And sometimes we translate Guoshe as Confucian studies, but it's, it's really more than that. In these uh, Guoshe schools, there are uh, Buddhist and Taoist texts that are learned. Kids memorize these. Uh, their parents think of memorize, you know, they also do it, they memorize poems as well, the Tang Dynasty poems and so on. But there is definitely a spiritual component, the idea that we need, that kids need to learn values. Uh, I think that's very important for you parents. <clears throat> Frank Kale, uh, your talk has mainly been uh, religion from the perspective of the government. I'm sure you've interviewed numerous uh, members of the five official religions and whatever unofficial. When you talk to them, what do they say about why they are seeking religion or doing the practice that they're doing. Um, what's the range of their responses? Um, and how similar or different is it from uh, religious seekers anywhere? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I did focus on the government's perspective, maybe because, uh, because of the party congress and, and sort of Xi Jinping's ideas and are in the air. But uh, of the five groups, the five case studies that I wrote about, only, only one of those groups is the government. The other four are different religious practitioners. So I, I write about a, a Buddhist pilgrimage or group in Beijing, uh, Taoist priests in rural Shenxi province, this church in Chengdu, and people who practice a meditation technique primarily in the uh, Zhejiang area. Um, and I think there are a couple of common points that unite all of these faiths and, and, and groups. 
One is a search for community. The idea that China, Chinese cities, that they lack community. You have to remember that up until not too recently, most Chinese, the overwhelming majority of Chinese people lived in villages. And <coughs> urbanization has taken place at a dramatic rate. And even for people living in the cities, most people in, in the traditional communist era up until the 90s, they lived in these work units, these Dan Wei areas, which were like many villages where you lived in a housing compound with people you worked with by and large, or maybe went, your kids went to the same school, or at least in elementary school, was like that. So there was a sense of community. Now the downway system is broken down, people are flooding into cities, and there's no sense of, of an anchor for people. And, and religious groups provide that, or can provide that. So if you think of the Christian groups, they are able to proselytize most effectively on college campuses and most effectively among young people who have moved to the city to pursue higher education. Maybe they don't have a lot of friends and they, they um, then get, go to Bible study. And maybe it's just, it's often starts out as an English corner or singing or something like that, folk singing. And you know, the message is then brought out about Christianity and some people are interested, join and others don't. But that's one area, you see it also in the other religions as well, uh, these pilgrimage associations. These are groups of about 50 people um, who help facilitate in some way a pilgrimage to a holy mountain. Maybe they organize buses and groups of people to go to the holy mountain, but they stay in contact throughout the rest of the year, because the pilgrimages just take place usually once or twice a year. So the rest of the time they're, uh, they meet uh, many of them have little shrines in their homes. Uh, so I think the community uh, is, is an important aspect. And another thing that I think unites a lot of people is this feeling, I was mentioning the amorality or the sense, this lack of minimum moral standards, this feeling that society needs to have justice, that there has to be some, some idea, the traditional Chinese idea of, of heaven or tian, that there should be something that um, is higher than just the last government slogan or the latest thing to be enshrined in the party's constitution, that there has to be something more meaningful. Um, and, and this idea, I think, of justice is something that people pursue as well. Uh, it, it is more in a more spiritual sense, uh, not in the sense of human rights activists fighting for justice, although it's noticeable that this big human rights lawyer movement, the Weichuan movement, about by pretty good estimates show that about a quarter of these lawyers were Christian, which is disproportionate to the population. I would say roughly 5% of China is Christian, but about 25% uh, of the Wei Chuan movement was Christian. So it, it can inspire people also in social action, but I don't think of it primarily as some sort of a, you know, a covert social activity that's gonna challenge the, the Communist Party in the next uh, decade. Hi, uh, my name is Chris. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, and my question has to do a little bit with your process. You mentioned that there were instances where you were doing journalism assignments and then breaking in a little bit more time to be, to be sniffing around a little bit on this side. And you also started off by talking about how traditionally in China and everywhere else, religion was part of more of a holistic thing where we've moved towards something where we think of these discussions and practices being fairly limited to certain parts of our lives. Is there anything you can say about if over the course of the time you were reporting the stories that came into this book, there was any change in how difficult it was to get people to talk about that part of their life? Uh, did that necessarily include you talking about your own experience with spirituality? And did you see any change in, in people's willingness or what it took to get in those kind of conversations started along generational lines or in reaction to what you're describing at the government level in terms of encouraging, uh, you know, a certain amount of this that was happening happening anyway. Yeah, um, that sort of hopscotching around between journalism and, and writing the book. Or I wasn't writing the book actually. That was doing work for the charity. That was in the 1990s, and so I quit uh, daily journalism in 2010, and I now do, I work as a freelancer in Beijing, and I also teach um, at, at this academic exchange center in Beijing. Um, my process for finding these groups was maybe more academic because I, I do um, advising work for the Journal of Asian Studies and I uh, have written a few academic papers and so I wanted to find 
representative case studies. And I, so I wanted geographic diversity, I wanted different religions, I wanted, so for example, trying to find the, the Christian group. I looked at a, a lot of different Christian congregations. I went to Winjo, which is sort of a center of Christianity. I went to Hunan, which is another center of Christianity. Uh, and then I settled on this group because I thought it was more representative of the direction that Christianity was, was moving toward. Um, but my process was, so I tried to find these groups and then I uh, went, introduced myself, or networked in through other people or academics or people who I knew had been doing research and work or some of it was random uh, meeting people and then trying to evaluate who would be go a good, who would make a good case study. Um, and I didn't find it difficult at all, actually. It was really easy, far easier than writing about Xi Jinping in the 19th Party Congress or, or anything like that because I found that people really wanted to talk about this, mm -hmm. that they felt that, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier before the talk, I think all people in the world feel misunderstood. All countries, you know, Americans often feel misunderstood. There's caricatures of America that they're all gun-toting yahoos, you know, uh, and doing this, that, and the other thing, and many Americans can't sort of uh, identify with that picture that, that they see in the, in abroad. Um, Chinese people also. Chinese people were happy that I, the Chinese people I talked to, at least, that someone w was willing to spend time and hang out with them. And, and I did have to spend a lot of time. And I think the more time you spend, once you've got your foot in the door, um, that people then respect that and they think it's great. And, and you couldn't, in a way, you couldn't ask enough dumb questions because people would say, "Oh, he's really serious." So then you, you know, you say, what I would often do is I, I recorded everything. I rec and I had, I mean, I have hundreds of hours of recordings at church services and at, at other at pilgrimages, talking to people with their permission. And then I'd go and I got it transcribed. Often people were talking with very heavy accents. I speak Chinese, but even in Beijing, I tell you, it was, this is not, you know, a Beidou professor talking. This is like talking to somebody in, you know, 19th century London, so Cockney working class. And it's like, I thought I knew Mandarin. This guy's not speaking Mandarin. <laughs> Beijing Hua, you know, and, and all this, and all this um, yeah, slang, but also religious slang and, and, and vocabulary. So I'd go get it transcribed, I'd read it, and then I'd say, well, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, right. So then I'd go back the next time. And I'd say, well, you know, last time you mentioned blah, blah, blah. And then we talked about it over and over again. So trying to figure out people's, how, how they be, became interested in religion or their personal story. And yes, people asked me also. Um, and they didn't expect people to have the same faith. In fact, I think Chinese people often d don't expect you to be Chinese. They, they're very interested if you are interested in Chinese. They love that if you're interested in Chinese culture. But they think the world, that, that, that China is such a special thing, right? You can never really become Chinese. You'll never really learn everything we know as Chinese people. So they were very, to very tolerant and open-minded uh, and uh, spent just a, a ton of time explaining things. So I found it was actually pretty, pretty easy. I wasn't chased by police. And, um, you know, there were sometimes, the congregations, there were some congregations where um, it, was maybe awkward. These were often the really small, young congregations that were still in a, in a living room. And then I just thought, look, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna, I, I need to spend scores of hours in this church. If I'm not welcome, or I'm gonna be getting people in trouble, or I have to go in like this all the time, it's not worth it, because it's not some sort of power drop mission where you just get in there, interview people, and get out, like you might for a, for a, a, a newspaper article. You have to be able to hang out with people. But the church I wrote about in Chengdu is on the 19th floor of an office building. There are lots of foreigners and people going up, not, for, not a lot of foreigners, a lot of people going up and down the elevators all the time. So I just got off at the 19th floor. Jen? Jen Barris was mentioned to me. You just mentioned that some of these congregations were young congregations. So did you find across the five religions or any of the other institutions that you visited, a difference in age in terms of generations? I mean, did, does the Catholic Church tend to be older? Because in the old days when we used to go to church or take delegations to church, 
it was only older people in the churches, in the Catholic and Protestant churches. I know that's now beginning to change, but so is there a difference in the different religions as to whether people go as a family and children are inculcated from a young age and so it's a multi-generational or are some more older or younger than others? Could you add gender into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, well, the difference uh, in terms of age, to take that first, um, I found over, overall the uh, a, a younger demographic, there are not demographic surveys done of these groups. Obviously, it's too, religion is too sensitive to even be able to get Con concrete numbers on the number of believers. So everything is triangulating estimates and survey work. But I think it is, it is younger. The youngest groups are probably the unregistered Protestant churches. Um, those are often quite big uh, with hundreds of, of members. Uh, there's a church that I take my students to in Beijing around the corner from the uh, UIBE where I teach, the University of International Business and Economics. And it's, uh, it's funny, you, know, you, you get off at the third floor, in this case, of the office building, you open, doors open, and they have bought this floor of the office building, and to the right is a sort of, st is a Starbucks style uh, cafe with a bookstore and so on and so forth. In front of you is a big cross with a couple of verses from the Bible um, that's been affixed to the wall, and they have a, um, a, uh, a sort of ballroom type area where they have the church services. So that, those are probably the youngest groups, but I, saw, I thought also many of the pilgrimage groups have surprisingly young members. The children of the founders of these are taking it up. Um, Catholicism is probably, I don't know, but my gut feeling is it's probably older. Uh, overall, I think that's because the countryside Catholicism was primarily or predominantly, let's say, rural in nature in China. Um, as China has urbanized, the church has struggled to keep up with that flow, and so you have many young Catholics who leave the villages, the, the traditional Catholic villages in Shanxi and Hebei. They go to Shijiazhuang. They go to Beijing. And the, the church is not there for them. Because I think Protestant churches just have, are, are less hierarchically organized. It's easier for them, for, for a church just to sort of set up. Um, and the Catholic church at least still has more structures. And it just seems harder for them to set that up. It's, it's a discussion point inside the Catholic church. People are aware of it. They talk about it. But um, it still seems to be an issue. But what about in terms of Buddhism and Taoism? And you haven't talked much about Confucianism. We've talked about the bullshit, but yeah. where does that fit into all of this? And are people comfortable with multiple religions that they practice? Uh, yes, no. The, uh, as I mentioned, the, the pilgrimage associations, they do have young members. Uh, there are a lot of young people going to temples uh, around China. The, you can see on, on big holidays. Uh, I, I think the, are they comfortable? Yeah, I think people are comfortable in this amalgam of traditional religions. I think it's better to think that, think of that as an organic whole, Buddhism, Taoism, folk religion, Confucianism. Um, this, these distinctions are artificial distinctions that were imported in the early 20th century when society was being remade along Western lines. Tr traditionally, they hardly existed. Um, temples were overwhelmingly not divided. Buddhism and Taoism, it was not like churches in the West that had a, a clergy uh, and you had, we, we could say, these 5,000 temples in China were Buddhist and those 10,000 were, were Taoist or something like that. Traditionally, religion was not organized like that. And I think people now feel comfortable, again, in this amalgam of, of traditional religions. Uh, the gender question that you mentioned, in the churches, I th think there are a lot more women who are worshipers. Uh, in terms of the leaders of the churches, it's still male, uh, overwhelmingly male. The church that I wrote about, uh, they actually kicked a, a, a church elder and his wife out because the elder's wife had taken the courses in theology, wanted to 
have some sermons, uh, give some sermons, and she was not allowed to do that, and, and, and he kicked them out of the church, actually. Uh, so you still see that in a lot of churches, um, where it's uh, male-dominated. Uh, in Buddhism, Taoism, there are nuns, um, but maybe 25% of the clergy are female, 75% are male, roughly. Unfortunately, it's past the witching hour, if that's the appropriate word. Um, so please join me in thanking Ian, and please buy copies of the book. Thank you. Hi, nice to see you. How are you? Hi. Uh,